And now we move to the third of our presentations, and I will introduce you to uh, Mary Byrne, who's the Head of Special Education here at the NCSE. Mary is a very experienced um, person. She is involved with the development and researching of evidence-based uh, policy recommendations, which are then passed on to the Minister for Education and Skills. She's also, of course, had worn, has worn many hats during her career, one of which was as a senior lecturer in special education at the College of Education in Rathmines, the, Col the College of Ireland Education um, uh, sorry, Teacher Education College in Rathmines. And prior to that, she was a learning supports teacher in two schools. So without further ado, can I invite Mary to present on special education in post-primary schools and looking at the developments. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sheila mentioned, my presentation here this morning is going to focus on special education in post-primary schools. I'm going to look at some of the changes that have taken place in post-primary schools over the last 10 years. We know a little bit now about what is working well and where are the challenges for post-primary schools. And for this presentation, um, NCSE has drawn together some key statistics and we are, by those statistics, we are raising some questions here this morning. One of those questions is, do we have greater inclusion in our post-primary schools? Or is it that we have greater retention or diagnosis of special educational needs? And in thinking about that question, I think we're posing it for post-primary schools, but I think we're also posing it for researchers in our audience and for our academics and other experts here in our audience this morning. Let's start with the EPSONAT in 2004. And this act stated, and this section of the EPSON Act is commenced. And it says that a child with special educational needs shall be educated in an inclusive environment with children who do not have such needs, unless the nature or degree of those needs would be inconsistent with the best interests of that child or the effective provision of education for other children with whom that child is being educated. So, what has been happening then since 2004? Well, first of all, we've had a 14% increase in the post-primary school population. I'm not going to go through all the figures with you. You can see them there on the slides for yourself. But basically, we've gone from 303,000 up to around 345,000. In the last five years, we've had a 68% increase in children or students in post-primary schools who have low incidence disabilities, rising from over 9,000 to over 15,000 students. If we look at the profile of those students, it is interesting to see, and I've only selected out here a number of different categories. Most of you here in this audience, we know we have 14 categories of low incidence um, and high incidence special education needs. And so we've selected out just a number of those categories to take a particular look at here this morning. Students who, with a diagnosis of autism in post-primary have gone up by 120% in the last five years. Those students in the physical category by 89%. Those in the multiple category by 79%. And those with a specific speech and language disorder by 71%. Interestingly, students in the category that we describe as having a moderate general learning disability have decreased by 32%. EBD is up by 
and students who have been diagnosed with a severe emotional behavioural disorder are up by 12%. In the same period, there has been a rise by 190% of the numbers of special classes in post-primary schools. Now, that's a big increase, but we did start at a very low base in 2011, and of course, this increase reflects the fact that a lot of our students who are in special classes in primary schools are now coming into our post-primary system. So, with the increases in the numbers of students getting resource hours in post-primary schools, with the increased number of special classes in post-primary schools, one would expect that there has been a decrease in the numbers of students in special schools. But actually, enrolment in special schools in the same period, or sorry, over the last 10 years, has gone up by 20, I can't see my own figures, 26%. Now, I think it's still important to say that internationally, and comparing figures internationally, Ireland still has a very low overall percentage of students in special schools, and that has remained fairly static at below 1% of our students. So the numbers of students have gone up. And there has been a corresponding increase in the funding of special education um, over that period of time, rising from uh, 605 million in 2005, which represented 9.8% of the total education spend, to 1.5 billion. And this is a projected figure for 2016, because obviously we're not at the end of 2016. But the projected figure for 2016 is 1.5 billion, uh, which will represent 17.8% of the total education budget. In the same period of time, there has been an increase in the numbers of teachers in special education in our schools. Learning support teachers are up by 10%. Resource teachers by 45%. Special class teachers by 190%, reflecting the increase in special classes. So the total number of teachers in the post-primary system in the last five years is up by 45%. And the numbers of special needs assistants has also risen by a figure of 28%. There have been other significant changes in special um, education in post-primary schools um, over that period, and I think it is important this morning that we acknowledge some of those changes. We have had a loss of middle management posts, which we are told by our post-primary colleagues has had an effect on the level of coordination that can take place in post-primary schools. There has been an increase in student-teacher ratios over that time. We have had a very high turnover of experienced principals and teachers. And given the real importance of principals and teachers in the education of students with special education needs, that must have an effect in the level of understanding and knowledge there is in our systems. The allocation for low incidence for children with low incidence incidence disabilities um, ha, is now at 85% of what it was five years ago. There has been changes to the high incidence hours in post-primary schools, whereby now we don't make individual applications for children with high incidence disabilities, but rather the number of high incidence hours in post-primary schools has been kept the same since 2011. And we've had some very positive curricular changes, whereby the NCCA has been involved in the development of Level 1 and Level 2 junior cycle programmes, offering a wider range of curricular choice for students in post-primary schools. So what is working well? Well, in, in looking at what is working well, the NCC has looked at a number of our recent research studies and three in particular. One is the experiences of post-primary students with special education needs. Uh, Dr. Gary Squires is here and he's going to be presenting on that paper here this afternoon. 
We've also looked at a study that was conducted for us by Mary Immaculate College, the evaluation of education provision for students with autism spectrum disorders. And we've looked at the findings of our uh, three-year longitudinal study, which was done by the University of Northampton in conjunction with TCD. And uh, so, what do we know from these studies? Well, we know that inclusion works best when we have a school culture of welcome, where students feel welcome in school and where there are strong leaders. We know it works well where there are high aspirations and expectations for all students, including those who have special education needs. We know it works well where there are high standards for teachers and where teachers are encouraged and expected uh, to engage in continuing professional development and specialist training. We know it works well when parents are engaged in their children's education. And we know that positive staff-student relationships are extremely important. And we know that we have made good progress. Our research studies are telling us that 87% of post-primary schools surveyed felt that the resources allocated to them had a positive impact for teachers and for students in their schools. We know we have improving teacher knowledge in our post-primary schools. We know that we have strong in-school leadership and good structures. And we know these things because these are the findings of our research studies and also because in a lot of the consultations that NCSE has conducted over the last number of years, these are the things that people are telling us. We know that most parents and students are satisfied now with the provision that is being made for them. Programs like the Junior Cycle Schools Programme and the Leaving Cert Applied Programme have had significant benefits where they are available in schools in providing access and well-matched content. And we know that SNA's support is highly valued by parents and teachers. And very often it is highly valued by students in post-primary schools, but we might come back to that point later. We know we have improved retention rates. In the 1998 entry cohort, 83.6% were retained in school to do their leaving certificate. That increased to 90.6% for the 2008 entry cohort. And very importantly, we know that our retention rates in post-primary, in our DESH post-primary schools, are also improving from 68.2% in 2001 to 82.4% in 2008. And that's a very significant increase. So we are doing some things really well. But obviously, all is not rosy in the garden, and we do have some challenges. In our research reports, teachers reported, only 38% of post-primary teachers reported that they felt confident in differentiating for students in their classroom. We know that we need to do more in post-primary about individualised planning for students. It's happening in some schools, but it's not happening everywhere, and it's not happening in the same way. We know we need better assessment techniques and we know, and this is really important I think, we need greater teacher linkages between what's happening in the mainstream class teacher and what's happening with the resource and the learning support teachers. Students tell us that, that their experience is that they don't feel there's always high expectations for them. We have identified that in post-primary, and, and there's a specific difficulty in post-primary schools around the deployment of resource teacher hours, where in certain instances, the teachers who are assigned to take those hours are not experienced and have not knowledge in working with students with special education needs. Another problem that arises specifically in post-primary is that the resource teacher hours are spread across quite a number of teachers' timetables. So it's very difficult for students to get a coherent experience of uh, education in, that, in those cases. Whilst SNA support is really very valued, 
there is a question about the appropriateness of that support in all cases for all students in post-primary schools. And we have to raise the question about what kind of models of support do we need in post-primary to ensure that we are developing students who are ready to leave school and ready to contribute to their own lives once they do leave school. We have some data on academic achievements of students in post-primary, but we don't have data on their social uh, achievements and other important information. We don't have data on outcomes when they leave school and so on. So there's work to be done in terms of the information that we are gathering. An interesting finding when you look across our research is that students with special education needs are reporting that they are experiencing some level of bullying in post-primary schools. But that wasn't a finding that came through from parents and teachers. So one would question where the gap is there. We know our NAMSBY in 2011 uh, did a, an important study and they identified that there is a drift um, at the end of primary to special schools. So the numbers of students of post-primary age are increasing in our special schools. Now, what I thought is really interesting there is when you look at the reasons that students and teachers gave for these students leaving post-primary, um, 57% gave academic as the reason, but actually more gave an emotional reason. That they just felt emotionally they wouldn't be able for post-primary, or socially they wouldn't be able for post-primary, or that their behaviour wouldn't be able maybe to be managed in a post-primary school. I think they're really interesting findings. Generally, as uh, NCSE conduct our various consultations, we're told all the time about the lack of therapeutic services to schools, and particularly, I suppose, in a way, to post-primary schools. We have identified that the resource teaching model is an inequitable one. And I'm not going to dwell on that this morning, because I think we have spoken at length about that. But simply to say that the, the, the assessments leading to diagnosis is not there, um, and yet in order to be able to get your resource teaching in both primary and post-primary schools, you must have these assessments. So we've identified that as one difficulty. We've identified other difficulties as well, but I'm not going to go into those this morning. We in NCSE have spoken over the last number of years about the fact that some post-primary schools are still putting barriers in place. We refer to them as soft barriers, but actually people have said to me they're actually not that soft sometimes. They can be quite hard barriers for students to get across to get into post-primary schools. Where some post-primary schools are saying we're not resourced to work with students with special education needs, even though all schools are resourced by the NCSE in the same way. Um, or they're told we don't have the programs, we don't have the experience, we don't have the knowledge here uh, to include students with special education needs. The last speakers, um, I think, gave a lot of information about special classes. We know that they are unevenly distributed around the country. We know that some post-primary schools insist that students who come into post-primary uh, special classes must be able to be included at least for some of the day academically, and they must be able to fit in socially. But the reality is that for some students with complex needs who need to be placed in a special class, that's an impossibly high barrier for some of them. Um, they, some other schools require that they meet the mainstream enrolment, and if that mainstream enrolment includes the local catchment area, that excludes a lot of children who need to be placed in special classes who will come from without that school's uh, catchment area. And we know that inclusion practice is variable. Some schools seek every opportunity to include students in special classes in their, with their mainstream colleagues. In other cases, there's very little inclusion. We need to ask, do we have the right CPD model for post-primary? And I've looked at some of the SESS figures for 2015. And the fewer post-primary schools apply to the SESS, fewer post-primary principals apply to the SESS. And I think an important difference is that generally in post-primary schools, 
It's the resource teacher who attends the CPD. Whereas in primary, it is the class teacher. And I think that is a significant difference because what we want to do is we want to be get, getting that training right through our uh, mainstream teachers. So what has been the impact of Section 2 of Epson? We've had an increase, 68% in children, students with low incidence disabilities. We have increased teachers in SNAs. We have increased numbers of special classes. However, there's been no reduction in the special school population. We know now there's a drift to special schools at sixth class. We have increasing numbers of special classes. And we have little, if any, data on the impact these resources are making or on our student outcomes other than academic. So, the question that we are raising is, do we actually have more inclusion in post-primary schools? Or is it that we are retaining more students, which in itself, of course, is a good thing? Or is it simply that these students were always in our post-primary schools, but we now have greater diagnosis? Before I pose the final questions I want to pose this morning, I think it's important to look at the overall level of support in schools, in both primary and post-primary. We now have 59,000 teachers in the system, of which well over 12,000 are learning support and resource teachers. So in other words, of the 59,000 teachers we have in our system, more than 12,000 of those are there for students with special education needs. We have over 1,100 special classes, of which around 75% are for students with autism. We have 1,200 special school teachers, and we have now around 12,900 SNAs in our schools. I was very interested this morning in what Professor Slee was saying about resources and being resourceful. So what I would like to ask now, how can we use our resources in a resourceful way to ensure that our very good looking and happy owl at the start of the year doesn't end up looking very frazzled? And I think the owl represents both teachers and students in our post-primary schools. So the questions that we want to leave post-primary schools with this morning is, how can we embed a culture of inclusion as a whole school reality, so that when our students come to post-primary, they feel welcome, they feel a part of the school, and the experience that they have is a similar one, whether they're in woodwork, whether they're in English, whether they're in Irish, whether they're in PE. Given the importance of school leadership, how do we ensure that principals are committed to inclusion? And I would include deputy principals there too, and the people who do the timetable, because that's a very important thing in a post-primary school. How do we ensure that teachers in special roles, how do we ensure that our teachers in special classes, our resource teachers and our learning support teachers are knowledgeable and experienced and promote high standards of teaching? Because we now know that maybe above everything else, it's the teachers that make the greatest difference for students with special needs. How are we going to collect and use the, the data that we need to tell us whether our resources are being effective or not? And very importantly, if our new model is to be introduced, how can we ensure that the additional resources, and they are very big and very significant level of resources going into our schools, how can we ensure that those resources are being used to best effect and that they are ensuring that our students are progressing in line with their ability? How do we ensure that all students have access to suitable programmes and certification? And I would really ask post-primary schools here this morning to think in particular about the Level 2 Junior Cycle programme, which is now available from the NCCA, but my understanding is that there's a slow enough uptake on that. I think we have a really important challenge to ensure 
that our students are independent when they're leaving school? And are we managing to do that? Are we, at the end of their school life, preparing young adults for life after school so that they can really contribute to their societies and that they can reach their own individual potentials? Are we including our student voices? And can we ensure that the expectations that parents have for their children are heard, considered? And where maybe those expectations are a little bit unrealistic, can we help parents and can we manage those expectations? Before I go to questions, I, want, I was very struck this morning by um, the definition that Professor Slee offered us um, where from, I think it was Alan Terrain. So I think the question really is, is it more retention? Is it greater diagnosis? Or are we really including more students in our school? And if we are including more students in our post-primary school, do they have access? Do they have representation? And are we bringing together identities with equal status? Thank you very much.